Cities are the front line for humanity's biggest challenges. Cities are where the abstract, like environmental sustainability, connects to your light switch. Cities need innovation. And at the same time, our planet is urbanizing. Over half the human population lives in cities today. And cities are producing a disproportionate share of economic activity. So in short, cities are the biggest opportunity and the biggest market on planet Earth. It's no surprise there's more and more innovation for cities. There's more and more city technology. Last year alone, venture capital flooded into city technology, over $44 billion. So what is this? City technologies are the physical products, the digital infrastructures, or the place-based services that use innovation to solve an urban challenge. Many of these companies are familiar names. You've probably heard of them or used them. And frankly, those statistics I shared are pretty familiar as well. None of this is a surprise. But I see an issue here. There's a problem that not everyone is benefiting from city technology. In fact, over 20% of the increase in economic inequality since the year 1990 is a direct result of uh, innovation and technology. More innovative cities have greater inequality. And almost all of those tech companies I showed, they're clashing with city governments as they rush to disrupt and capture a market and solve a specific problem, they're creating a whole host of issues in the long run. We're seeing more and more lawsuits and alienated customers. So it's increasingly clear that business as usual doesn't work for cities. And government as usual, it doesn't work for the digital era. There are two incompatible logics. On the one hand, there's an ethos of disruption, aiming for the highest margins, the most users, moving fast, even if that means leaving some people behind. And on the other hand, an ethos of regulation, thinking about under-resourced populations, moving through bureaucracy, moving slowly, even if that means missing the boat on some technologies. So there are examples of this tension playing out right here in Boston. In 2016, Amazon made a big logistics play called free same-day delivery. This was a real innovation. It got packages to your door in a lightning fast matter of hours. But it wasn't uniformly available. This map shows which neighborhoods in Boston had access to that additional service. Or more specifically, which single neighborhood did not have access. There's a hole right in the middle of Boston. And it corresponds to one of the most low-income neighborhoods called Roxbury. So this became a big issue. There was an expose in Bloomberg Business. And um, Amazon defended its decision. They said, wait a second, this is just a calculation of member density. It's a calculation of how close the warehouse facilities are. In other words, it's really good business logic to leave out the neighborhood of Roxbury. But how could that be right? Arguably, a neighborhood like Roxbury needs better access to inexpensive delivery because those are the neighborhoods that don't have good options nearby. They're the neighborhoods that chain stores systematically avoid. Using a similar logic, Boston's mayor put pressure on Amazon, and finally the company relented. Soon after, the, the mayors of New York and Chicago followed suit. So how should city technology be deployed? Who should benefit here? Will there always be this tension between enterprise and government? More recently, you may have followed the, uh, the controversy around bird scooters, right? This looks familiar. This happened right here in Cambridge over the summer. There are more and more companies that offer dockless bikes or electric scooters. Micromobility is a really hot market in city tech. And so Bird, they wanted to get in fast. They wanted to capture users. They wanted to, uh, to get in first. And they saw a winner-takes-all market. So almost overnight, they dumped a fleet of scooters on the sidewalk. My colleagues and I followed on the app. We wanted to see what deployment day would look like. As you can imagine, this wasn't actually legal. Streets and sidewalks are in the public right of way, and safety matters. Accessibility matters. And so within weeks, the city of Cambridge tried to shut down Bird's operations. Bird said no, and we took to the app again. We wanted to see what would happen. And we found those scooters. We found them all in one place, actually. 
It was the, the Department of Public Works. <laughs> The scooters had been impounded. And, and this legal battle still hasn't been resolved, actually. From a designer standpoint, I'm thinking, who are these things designed for anyway? Frankly, they're for me. They're for people who are young and fit. They're for techies and students. So I'm genuinely conflicted. Are these a sustainable mobility alternative, or are they an unsafe eyesore that's designed for prototypical users? Business logic? or government logic. How about spatial data itself? Google Maps is a tool to, un to navigate unfamiliar spaces. It's also a way for small businesses to literally get on the map, find new customers. I use it all the time. But have you noticed that when you pull up your Google Map, it shows you only a few places? Here's my Google Map of this neighborhood in Cambridge. I wanted to see what is Google going to think is important to me. So you can see it shows me the MIT Museum, because I'm a nerd. It shows me Life Alive, because I'm a vegetarian. And of course, it shows me a brewery and a nightclub, because I'm a young male. And all I think about is beer and parties. <laughs> this, is, this is funny, but it's not that far off. And these are actually places I've been to a lot. So Google launched a new initiative on top of Maps, a new feature called uh, just for you, and it's focused on exploration. So essentially what this does is it links your demographic and your browsing behavior with your offline behavior, your suggestions of where to go and your routes for how to get there. The incentive here is to give you the suggestions you're most likely to enjoy. Makes sense. But in the long term, the hottest destinations are only going to get hotter, and the others are left behind. This doesn't really jive with a sort of balanced economic development policy. Not to mention that the same kinds of people get the same kinds of recommendations. So we're only getting more segmented along our profile lines. The city is becoming kind of like an echo chamber. Once again, business logic or city logic. See, these are all examples of business as usual applied to complex challenges of cities. It seems like city solutions are being shipped to us as if they're consumer technology. And that technology is designed for prototypical users. It's designed to be efficient and scalable. But that's just not how cities work. And governments are conflicted. They can't embrace all of this technology, but they also can't stop it. They can't regulate it. And they certainly can't solve all of their challenges on their own. And we're in between. We as the users, we don't have agency in either cities or technology. Sure, we're like voting and we're choosing which apps to use, but it really feels like cities and technology both just happen to us. So no one's winning in this situation. How we design city technology matters. How we deploy city technology matters. And it's only going to matter more and more in the long run, because I guarantee none of this is going to slow down. We live in a time of extreme economic inequality. We live in a time of extreme conflict between business and government. And every time this has happened in the past, there is a radical transformation, a transformation like the French Revolution. So let's imagine a new kind of revolution. Instead of struggling to reconcile two incompatible logics, let's think of a new logic altogether. Maybe we've been thinking in a really narrow way about innovation. Maybe we've been really lazy with city tech. I mean, there are like dozens of late night takeout delivery startups. There's nothing less innovative than a takeout delivery startup in 2018, let me tell you. So the answer isn't to do better innovation and drop it on cities. The answer here is to change how we innovate in cities and with cities. This is a revolution that I think of as civic innovation. So imagine, what if Amazon helped to alleviate food deserts? What if Bird improved mobility for people with disabilities? What if Google supported small businesses, and it caused you to meet new people, and it caused you to fall in love with your neighborhood again and again? There are companies that believe this can happen. They're working to flip the narrative. They're designing through collaborative prototyping, and they're deploying for equity. They know that when it comes to cities, 
Social impact is not about altruism. It's about long-term success for the company and for the city. With this vision, we started a new program at MIT in the School of Architecture and Planning called DesignX. It's essentially an accelerator for civic innovation. We invite students and faculty and researchers to pitch their ideas and prototype their solutions. We offer funding and an academic curriculum and a global network of mentors. And so far, these ventures are proving the thesis. They're proving that civic innovation works and it matters in cities. I'll show you a few examples. Um, the first is Biobot. Biobot began as a collaboration between an urban planner and a microbiologist. They thought that they could create a smart sewer sensor and it would sample the wastewater and create real-time data about public health. So they started working with the city of Cambridge. Here they are putting their robot in the sewer. And they quickly discovered a much more important use case together with the city, the opioid crisis. See, with high resolution, nearly real-time data, the city can target the most sensitive and effective interventions to help alleviate the opioid crisis. So Biobot's gone on to raise two and a half million dollars in venture capital. And they recently won the Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge at South by Southwest. Another company is called Nesterly. This is an intergenerational home sharing platform that is helping people age in place while fighting the, cost, the rising cost of housing. So the over 60 population is growing and most of those empty nesters have empty bedrooms. They need some help around the house. And students, people like me, they're looking for uh, inexpensive housing. So Nesterly puts those two together and chores cover part of the rent. So it's kind of like Airbnb and Angie's List and Zillow all put together. And uh, Nesterly did a pilot together with Boston, the, the Mayor's Housing Innovation Lab. They worked with eight households last fall, and it was such a success that they're now rolling out in the cities of Boston and Cambridge. You can sign up today. Finally, a company called Spaces. They're filling vacant storefronts with temporary artist studio space. This is counteracting two important trends in cities. The first is that retail is changing, and so downtowns are hollowing out. The second is that artists are getting forced out of their studios as studio space is converted to sort of trendy lofts or, or office spaces. So Spaces um, is creating a new vitality in the streetscape and also offering a real business opportunity for landlords. It's kind of amazing. There, there are two additional points here that I think are really interesting. The first is that Spaces worked really closely with the mayor's office and actually with the fire department to create a new temporary zoning class for creative pop-up space. This is like super boring and bureaucratic, but I think it's real innovation because it's opening the door to other small creative pop-up ventures in Boston in the future. The second is where they deployed. So the Spaces pop-up the first one wasn't in uh, the Seaport Innovation District. It wasn't in the Arts District um, or here in Cambridge. It was actually down in Roslindale, which is a part of Boston that I had never been to before their opening. So these civic innovators, they're working with residents and they're working with city governments. They're co-creating technology and the laws around it. In every case, the public prototyping is actually improving the technology itself or its use case. So I'm betting on these companies in the long run because they're designing into the fabric of community. So if the key to civic innovation is prototyping and testing with the public, we also don't want people just like opening up manholes and putting their robots in the sewer. We don't want people experimenting all the time anywhere. We need a way to support safe, legal, and productive experiments in public space. With that vision, I've been working with the mayor's office and with private companies, academia, philanthropies, to develop a new program called Betablocks. This is about experiments with civic innovation at the neighborhood level, and it has three key pieces. The first is community mission statements. So citizens get together in a sort of block party atmosphere, and they come up with new ideas or challenges that can make their public space better. We're keeping a catalog of civic innovation and ideas get matched with new technologies. When that match happens, we can run an experiment. This happens in public space and with residents. 
and it happens on top of baseline data. So we're collecting quantitative uh, information about how these technologies perform, um, the patterns of use, et cetera. We're also collecting qualitative feedback, how people feel about it, their ideas for how it could be better. So this is valuable for the technologists because they can iterate, they can make their stuff better. And it keeps residents at the center of the design process. So you can imagine sometime in the future, a neighborhood like Chinatown gets together. They have a block party and they decide their mission is to improve elderly residents' access to fresh food. Now, if you've been to Chinatown, you know there's food everywhere. So the solution here isn't more grocery stores. The solution is actually helping people get to the grocery stores. You can imagine where this is going here. Betablocks matches that mission with bird. And we can do a small experiment with some bird scooters. Maybe um, we find out that the app needs to be easier to use for elderly residents. Maybe people say, hey, I really want a basket on the front of my scooter so I can carry my groceries. And Bird can do a quick iteration with those simple changes. See, this is a win for everyone involved. Government has solved a real problem without paying a dime through standard procurement, which tends to be really slow and sort of tech averse. It's a win for Bird because they've created a new product and they've tapped into an entirely new market. Imagine all the baby boomers in any city who want to be able to age in place and have mobility options. And it's a win for the residents because they have a real solution. It's something that's proven to work for them. Betablocks becomes anyone's interface with local civic innovation. And over time, government becomes more fluent with um, experiments, with technology. Companies become more comfortable working with residents and with regulations. Soon, every block could become a beta block. I believe we're at a historic turning point in the future of cities. The tension between business as usual and government as usual is fraying our social and political and economic fabric. Technology is becoming the infrastructure of everyday life. And right now, we find ourselves at a unique moment to ask, what is that infrastructure going to look like? What is it going to look like? We need a revolution in how we design civic technology. We need civic innovation. And for that, we need your help. The ventures in DesignX need your mentorship. They need your business and your technical expertise. Betablocks needs your ideas, it needs your contribution, because every single one of you here is a resident of somewhere. Your expertise matters. So if we believe that the future is in cities, and if we believe that we have any hope of innovating to solve some of humanity's biggest challenges, then we need to change how we innovate. We can and we must be more than passive consumers of our cities and our technologies. We can all be civic innovators. Thank you.